Good afternoon, Cloud Community, and welcome back to fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. We're here midway through day one of Google Cloud Next, and it is just pumping 30,000 attendees this year, but I have two of the most important people at the show sitting with me. My name's Savannah Peterson, you're watching theCUBE. I'm joined by Rebecca Knight. Rebecca, we're just having the best day. We are, and I, I, one of the things that is really striking to me that we, are, we talk about all the time on theCUBE, but we're really talking about at this show, Google Cloud Next, is that Gen AI is, is the new way of doing business. It is, yes. it is part and parcel to the future of work, which is why I'm very excited about our next guest. Yes, me too. Rodney, thank you so much for joining us from McKinsey. Welcome, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, I'm excited to be here. It's your first time at the show as well, too. It's my first time at the show, and first time talking to someone with such amazing earrings. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll take the flattery. Doesn't always happen on the show, but yeah, I like you already, Rodney. We'll, we'll let you stay on. When we were just chatting before the show started, I was asking you, it's, it's your first time, you've been leading the digital side of the business for a while. What was it, what happened over the course of the last year within McKinsey, within your divisions, that, that brought you here and brought some departments together? Sure, well a little thing you might have heard of called generative AI. Hmm. Um, so the way we organize at McKinsey Digital, which we used to be sort of a small part of our firm, now it's about half of what we do, is we, do, we say we do three things. We do transforming businesses through the power of AI, um, we do digital business building, and then we do core technology modernization. And cloud was always our core technology modernization practice, so we have a group of amazing colleagues who lead that, and they were always here, and this was their meeting. Since late 2022, those distinctions have been pretty meaningless, and the most important topic in modernization has been actually how do you apply Gen AI to it. And my colleagues, um, Leandro Santos and Aaron Baucom led a fabulous session earlier today on how to use Gen AI for application modernization. We were excited to see it, I think, be the best attended, or best signed up uh, session of the conference. And it really just shows how these worlds are coming together. So it's exciting to be here. That is exciting. Oh, and I've got a book to promote as well. Well, that's just where I was going. <laughs> that's that, was, that was the segue I was looking for. <laughs> you brought a prop, you brought a brand new book that, it, that you have co-authored called Rewired. Um, congratulations, a book is a big deal and yeah. a lot of work. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about, about why, you, why you wrote it? Thank you. So nearly 30 years in, uh, in consulting, it's actually the second book I've written, uh, almost nobody read the first one, and um, <laughs> uh, on this one, um, we got very, very lucky with the timing. I mean, having a book come out that has AI and McKinsey Guide in the title, <laughs> timed with the Gen AI wave, we were just in incredibly, incredibly lucky. Um, How so long have you been working on it then? So we've been working on it, so it, the, the story goes back about four or so years, right? So we've been working on sort of digital transformation topics with our clients probably for nine, maybe 10 years, you know, as, as others have too. And what we realized about four or five years ago, we did sort of a retrospective and we said, okay, who's making money and who isn't, right? Where is this working, where isn't it? And our math was, this was sort of pre-COVID, 90% of, 91% of companies have something called a digital transformation, right? I'm surprised right. it wasn't 100%, but maybe that's the ones who aren't talking to me. But if you then say, okay, who's making money on it? About 25% of them only are hitting their cost objectives, and about 30% are hitting their revenue objectives. Ooh. So we're like, look, something isn't working. So we said, yeah. let's actually take 200 of the examples that work, and let's develop the playbook. So we did that, and initially it was a playbook just for our own consulting team, so we used it internally for a couple of years. But after having sort of a lot of success with it internally, some colleagues then sort of can convince me actually to say, look, let's actually go external with this and let's publish it as a book, which we did, and of course we then got very lucky with the Gen AI timing in there. And you know, the book, I would say, you know, captures the beginning of the Gen AI wave. Obviously, it's moving incredibly quickly, but we actually think it makes it, Gen AI makes it even more relevant because the amazing thing about Gen AI is it's the world's easiest technology to pilot but it's quite hard to get enterprise value at scale from it. So there's a bit of a risk, and we've seen many companies last year go back a bit to sort of 2015 in digital, where it's like death by a thousand pilots. Everyone wants to do something cool, wants to show it off externally, but you're seeing impact everywhere except in the actual P&L. So this is supposed to be the guide to how do you actually get it really into the P&L. So what's the answer to that? I was because, just going to say, <laughs> yeah. Because you're, you're absolutely right. We always hear about executives coming on, well we needed a POC, this is what we really wanted. And, and that's understandable because, because you, you, you want to see how is this going to work? What is this really going to do? But then having a zillion pilots, that is, that's, 
that's not going to work either. So what, what are the attributes that you look for to know, okay, this is a pilot that, is, that, that could really yeah. show us something? You want me to tell you the answer without paying forty dollars for the book? Sorry, <laughs> uh, I, I mean my I mother guess. already told me it's too expensive, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to put that it's in one of the out blurb on comments. Yeah, like that. This is not <laughs> now, 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 now. It's yeah. about value. It's a high it's quality yeah. service, yeah. is what I was high implying. level. Yes. High level. <laughs> so, yeah. so not high level, high quality. I like that better. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, what's I got you. Um, so what's the answer? The six pieces to the answer. So I'll walk through them. It's going to take a minute or two. So it actually starts at the top with business-led technology roadmap, right? And that might not be a popular thing to say here with 30,000 technologists, but you actually need a real financial target and you need business and technology working together. The most common failure mode was a CEO says, we're going to go do AI, and then every part of the organization goes off and does their own thing. And Silos, you get this like, yeah. not even so, just like death by a thousand pilots, right? The thousand flowers blooming thing. You actually need a senior team to align and to say, we're actually, there's many things we can do, but we're going to pick one big area of the business, one domain, and we're going to drive like an end-to-end -end transformation in that domain rather than sprinkling it everywhere and we're going to put a financial target against it. And what we found in the research was, if you set a financial target of 15 to 20% of EBITDA, your chance of hitting at least 80% of that financial goal is higher than if you set a target of two or 3% of EBITDA. Oh. So big targets lead to much higher percentage chance of attainment, because this is hard. You've got to get people to work together, you've got to sustain investment, you've got to work cross-functionally and so on. Anyway, that's chapter one. I'll go quicker on the other <laughs> chapters. Um, number two is about Great. people, and you know, one of the most fun findings in the research was the companies that went out and hired all the cool kids, all the technology natives and the Silicon Valley and London, whatever, that's a really great way to change your company dress code. It's not a great way to drive sustained business impact. So it's much more actually about upskilling and reskilling. And the companies that are in that money-making quadrant are investing hard in upskilling and reskilling the senior team and the front line. Third thing then is about operating model. And you know, I wish I had another word than agile, like because agile is like such a cliche. Like somebody, I've told never me, heard that word before. You've never heard it. So <laughs> yeah. The agile manifesto would have been old enough to graduate from college this year. I think. No, so like, is yes, that exactly. true? Oh, well, yeah. thank you for dating all <laughs> of us. <laughs> that one. Oh, Jeez. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, but that is still the secret. And in fact, what we found is it's not only um, every company says they're doing agile. What that often means is a tech team is working in Agile, right? It's the business and the tech team working together. But importantly, and importantly in regulated industries, the control functions, right? You need legal, you need regulatory, you need quality, whatever it is. If they're not in the Agile pods, you got nothing. So fourth is technology. Technology, of course, is in the list, right? But it's never just tech. And what we found is companies can succeed by doing you know, massive horizontal cloud migration, create amazing perfect data lakes, that's long, slow, and expensive. Much better to start with the business problem and to do the focused technology modernization in that area. Um, fifth is data. And in data, we saw two common problems. Number one is most companies overestimate the value of their own data. And the reality is it's your data plus the world's data coming together, right, that creates really the unique value. And then the other thing is data governance, right, which is sort of like a boring topic, and people think like- But critical right now. Absolutely. Mission critical. Absolutely, and, yeah. and you know, every company thinks they're always like one AI use case away from Nirvana, and you never are, right? Our research shows it's like <laughs> 10 or 11 different ones before you can actually see impact in the P&L. But if you've not done the hard work on data governance, those become more and more expensive instead of cheaper and cheaper as you go. And then the last one, sorry, I know you're looking at me. This like, is I need great. To make I'm literally yeah. taking yeah. notes. Yeah. So to be very clear, that's well, what's going on. As long as the on. notes don't stop you from getting yeah, the no, book. I'll, I'll yeah, no, I'll still get the book, don't worry. I understand the high quality <laughs> and the value in that. So the last one then is adoption and scaling. And some of these are sort of the traditional change management levers around a consistent change story from the CEO. You've got to involve the front line. You need role modeling. But actually it's about incentives, right? So the number of companies where someone will say, you know, what's going on with the AI initiative? And they'll turn and look at the CIO or the CDIO, whereas instead they should be looking at the business leader also, and the two of them together should have a joint incentive. So that simple thing of aligning the incentives between business and tech makes an enormous difference on adoption and scaling. So there you go, that was 400 words and 400 pages in four minutes. That's
Well, Very well done, and you no, brought it full circle. And, it, and it's really terrific. What I'm hearing so much of is that it really is a change management uh, ideas that have to go into it. I mean, it's so much about getting the people on board, getting the, the, them aligned, getting them incentivized, getting them motivated toward working towards something. Can you talk a little bit more about, about the strategy of hiring the coolest kids who, who, who graduated with these uh, nerd degrees uh, versus reskilling the, the, the current workforce. Because I think that, that particularly at this time where people, where some people who might be skeptical about Gen AI and what it might do for their, for their careers and their jobs, can you talk a little bit about this idea of reskilling and, and what you've learned from it? Yeah, so I was in a meeting a few weeks ago with um, the leadership team of a company and with one of the big generative AI players. And everyone was sort of swapping notes on the amazing things that Gen AI could do and how much impact it was going to have. And as we were having the back and forth, someone came up with sort of the clever thought that like, you know, the early winners from Gen AI are going to be dogs. They're going to be the biggest beneficiaries, right? Why dogs? Because if Gen AI is saving you 20 minutes a day, what are you going to do? You're going to go home and walk the dog. Uh, I love that this goes to dogs and not to kids or family. <laughs> <laughs> it was a tough crowd. Yeah. Yes. Let's I assume they're already being looked after and the yeah. dog is the marginal choice. Yes. But yes. Okay. So, like, so, you know, that's nice, right? That's wonderful for pet health, right? But like, how does that actually turn into improved corporate performance? You actually need your employees to say, not just how do I take the most boring 20 minutes of my day and automate it, but how do I change a week in the life of? And we actually see this really prominently. I think there's an early use case in, um, in software development, right? If you just give people the tools, right? And the tools are amazing and say, go use it, right? You see these like 10, 20% productivity improvements and I'm sure there's lots of happy dogs at the other end of it. But if instead you say, let's take a week in the life of, right? Let's think about everything, not just using it for whatever part is most difficult for you. Let's think about the whole system that needs to go around, not just developing the code, but the testing, you know, the commenting, the understanding the business rules that you're trying to code against and so on. Let's think about the whole business system. That's where you start to see the 40, 50, 60% improvements, which you can see in the PL. So it's the structured process of taking your employees through that, both your frontline employees who are using it in a hands-on way, but also the leadership team who need to know how to get value from it. And like a year, a couple of years ago, it was trendy to like go take senior leaders and put them on an MIT course and go have them learn to code and so yes. on. Like that can be like fun for awareness, but that's not the same as actually understanding the business potential of what you're doing. But also going back to the, the dog walking example, that is real. I think it was either Der Derek Thompson or Cal real. Newport or some brilliant future of work journalist who talked about the kind of innovation, the kind of creativity you get when you are doing something like walking your dog because you can't, I mean, I guess there are some people who walk their dog with their, their phones to their... Or solve a Rubik's yeah. Cube on water skis. <laughs> right. you know, depending on, depending on, on what you're doing. Inside joke there. Yeah. But, but, but the point being that that is the time where you can have a breakaway and that's when you get your, your big ideas or even your small ideas that, that can add up to something. You know, it's interesting because you know, early on, right, people looked at this technology as a productivity tool, right? It's about automation, simplification, da da da. The two big surprises, number one has been exactly where you were going, a creativity tool, yeah. right? So first of all, how well the models, and in particular the newer generation of the models, can do on being truly creative, right? And purists will say, oh, it's not real creativity, it's mimicking creativity, da, da. It mimics it bloody well. It yeah, right? sure does, like, and it's yes. only getting better. Exactly, yeah. so creativity tool, but also, when you take away some of the drudgery, how much time and freedom you actually have to be more creative is amazing. So we're seeing huge benefits in creativity. The other thing as well is we're seeing the conversation move from it being about productivity to it being about growth, right? And there's this one study from the UK last summer, right, that really I think opened up lots of people's eyes on growth. And this was um, a group of academics who wanted to see if patients could tell the difference between were they talking to a doctor who was texting them or were they um, talking to one of the chatbots, right? So the patient was assigned to one group or the other, they run it, da 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 da, and they asked the patients, you know, which one did you have? And to their disappointment, most patients could tell the difference, right? Even pretty elderly patients, 70% of the time. It's like, okay, Turing test failed, that's yeah, yeah. interesting. Right? <laughs> but then they said, okay, but which one did you prefer, right? The patients overwhelmingly preferred the chatbot, right? They thought it was more informative, right? So we knew more than the doctors. 
but also they thought it was more empathetic, right? Oh. It like listened to them better, right? So it's easy to like, you turn this into a joke about British doctors or something, <laughs> and my brother is one, so let's watch this. <laughs> um, but it's really about the power of these things for building human connection, and if done with integrity, therefore, how well that can help develop customer and stakeholder relationships and be a tool that's about growth and sales growth, not just about productivity. I think that's, I, I love that point, and, I, and the notion, I mean, doctors are humans too. It's not, anyone can have a bad day. You know, anyone can have something going on not in their external life. Not listen very well. Life. Yeah, or be distracted, or be hungry, or you know, who knows what's going on, or you just had a horrible thing happen with another patient, and I do, I, the, that's such a, I want to just hold on that anecdote for a second, that the notion of, of bots being more empathetic than us is not something that we normally think about. Given that we've just talked about all the, a lot of the good use cases, I got to ask you, do you think Gen AI is overhyped at all? Yes. <laughs> I mean, you, know, yeah. you don't get 30,000 people in Las Vegas without some degree <laughs> of hype, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, and it's I was in a, um, a client's board meeting late last year, and I was sort of waxing lyrical about how Gen AI was going to change the world. And a, a board member sort of interrupted me, and he said, you know, will you take a bet with me that Gen AI is going to be worth more next year than my NFT portfolio is worth this year? Right? <laughs> You're like, you know, that's a good question, right? But I actually would take that bet, right? And I think you've got to view it, I'm not sure three years from now we're going to be talking about Gen AI, right? It'll be yet another flavor of AI. So if you take this as the, 50 year journey of AI, right? And not the 15 month journey of Gen AI, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's very, very real. And I think what it does is, you know, it's the Swiss army knife of AI, right? This is the moment that makes it available for almost everybody in a democratized, lower cost, easier to learn way. Of course, with all kinds of risks and complexities that need to be managed. But we're going to look back on this as a real sort of kink in the curve in AI. But at the end of the day, it is still AI, and it's the broader AI story that's important. Tomorrow, you're going to be on a panel here with uh, the CEO of ING. Can you give our viewers a little preview of what you're going to be talking about? Yes, so it's Peter Jacobs, is the CEO of uh, ING Netherlands. Um, and uh, this is a... Um, so we, we talk about the four C's of where we're seeing Gen AI being applied, right? It's about, um, it's about customer engagement, it's about concision, so virtual experts, um, it's about coding, uh, and it's about creative content. Um, and with Peter, we're going to be talking about the, the first of those, the customer engagement. And ING, as many banks, all banks probably, have had a chatbot that's been pretty effective for a long time. And what they wanted to do was to try and harness this new technology, essentially to create a better, more engaging front end for their customers. And yes, there's a productivity aspect to it, but also it's back to where we were a moment ago with the doctors. It's actually how do you make it more engaging. And the success that they've had in using this to really drive customer engagement and customer satisfaction. And to do that in obviously a highly regulated, highly sensitive, highly important market, um, and in a, in a culture that is used to innovation, but also has incredibly high standards. I mean, I, I won't tell his story for him, I won't let him tell it, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting one to be on stage with him talking about. Excellent. Yeah, what a great customer example, and, and, and exciting. The whole show is a lot about customer examples. I'm curious, we were mentioning, and we were chatting about your daughter earlier. And without incriminating her Rubik's Cube skills, shout out to your daughter, by the way, hello. Uh, what, is, what is your daughter and her friends talking about in terms of Gen AI? Are they, is it a conversation for them? That's funny, so yes, yeah, so our daughter is our youngest. Our older two are already in college. And uh, you know, it's funny, actually, I'll, I'll talk about all three of them. So you yeah, know, please. Our, our oldest um, uh, is uh, about to start a, a PhD, and which in, in, um, in neuroscience, I was a PhD scientist years ago. I was going to say, well. like father, like daughter on that <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah. And he, he um, the amount of data, like the extent to which biology labs right now look like computer science labs, it's just amazing. I mean, he got more data in a summer internship than I did in the three years of my PhD. It's just been transformed, right? That's wild too. Our middle one about, really. is, um, is uh, poli sci, which she tells me that is a real science. I studied <laughs> political science. Yes. I, yes. Did, yes. I did as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. So, so we've got, we've got her back. Yeah, we've got exactly. her back on this yes. news desk. Okay. <laughs> yes. Clearly, both political yes. scientists yes. still. Yeah. So, I mean, the role that this is playing, right, in the ability to 
summarize and ingest like enormous amounts of information and just to really change how the policy field gets done, how the policy process gets done. I mean, never mind the whole you know, importance of regulation for sensible use of AI, but just yes. like how it changes someone's life as a policy professional. I saw Politico this morning, they're now sending out like AI generated summaries and so on. Like it's like if it's reaching like that part of the world, like it's going everywhere. Oh, it's big in journalism, yes. yeah. 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 And then our daughter's the real engineer, right? So she's <laughs> in high school and is very into robotics and so on. And you know, they have a team that competes in these robotics competitions and the extent to which they've already adopted Gen AI to like how they compete and win in these like high school robot competitions, it's unbelievable. And you know, what Amazing. I'm told, I don't have independent verification on this statistic, but I'm told is this year is the record year for dropouts from computer science in like elite university programs. Because people are looking at it and saying, huh, why do wow. I need to learn the drudgery of coding? So we think that's overstated, right? We actually think, you know, the elite coders will have superpowers, there'll still be a need for them. But the shift away from routine coding and into really sort of systems engineering and systems thinking, and then into like the human aspects that have to go around that, right? Into how you actually lead and build a team and influence people and so on. That's, that's clearly the wave of the future. Excellent. Uh, well, there's lots of And we didn't even mention solving a Rubik's Cube on water skis. <laughs> you didn't. You know, I was holding space. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <up. laughs> well, I think it's really cool, and I, and I think it's interesting too, because I mean, I even wonder. You know, we talk about Gen AI or AI. I wonder if to to your family, for example, it's just a tool. It's not even uh, you know delineated right, right. as artificial intelligence. They're just oh, I'm using Gemini. Oh, I'm using this product, and I'm going to go build this robot, which is rad. Yeah. Cash things. You yeah. Wow. You've been at McKinsey for almost thirty years. Yeah, I prefer to say 29, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is impressive. 29 forever. <laughs> Are we, and so as a result, I mean, you've been a part of a multitude of hype cycles. Is this hype cycle different, faster, more exciting, or comparable to some of the other technological hype cycles you've experienced in your wonderful career there? So if you say like this time it's different, right? You set yourself up for that like YouTube clip, you know, years I'm from now. I'm not setting so you on. up. I'm not setting <laughs> but, you up. But, 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 I genuinely yes, want yes, your yes, insight yes, on that. Yes, I genuinely but, want your insight. But I, I, I do, right? So, so I think the way we're increasingly talking about this is. This is the fourth platform revolution, right? So, you know, what does technology do in economic terms, right? It lowers the cost of something, right? The first was just in compute, right? Just lowering the cost of doing calculations, right? You don't need, you know, those women who are the computers in hidden figures, right? You don't need that anymore, right? When IBM and others transformed basic computing technology. Right, then there was the internet, right? And that transformed, that took down to almost zero the cost of distribution, right? You could get your ideas, your, op, your offer anywhere, right? And then, you know, Amazon and others and you know, many others sort of transformed that. Um, and Google, of course, like who would have thought that actually searching the internet would be the most lucrative application that you'd find on the internet? Right, then there's the third platform revolution. That was around mobile, right? That was lowering the cost really of, um, uh, of access, right? Just the fact that you can have this incredibly high compute power, you know, but really I guess mobile and cloud together, right? Mobile and cloud together really gave, you know, you know almost down to zero access to high performance compute. And this fourth one, right, this is, this is lowering the cost of human knowledge and ingenuity and creativity, right? This is like, you know, maybe ultimately driving down towards zero the cost of being a creative person with all the world's knowledge at your fingertips. So that's a revolution, right? I mean, there have been other revolutions before, but this feels, and certainly for white collar work, right, this feels as transformative or more transformative than any of those that came before. Very well stated and well summarized. Last question for you, Rodney. And, and you, well, I've, you've, got, you've said a lot of exciting things, so I don't know that you can just pick one. When we have you back on the show, next Google Cloud Next, what do you hope to be able to say then that you can't yet say beyond the fact that your Gen AI portfolio is worth more than your NFT portfolio? And that he's a yeah. best selling author. Yeah, yeah, and yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. Worldwide, yeah. So, I would like the dog still to be healthy and happy and warm, yeah. <laughs> but I would like to see many more companies and organizations who can point to real transformational business impact in their P&L. 
and we're seeing the early wave of that, but I think this is, this is the year of show me the money for, for impact from generative AI. Show me the money, show me the real, and, and get there by reading Rewired. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show with us, Rodney. This has been absolutely fabulous. I hope everyone picks up a copy. Rebecca, always a pleasure. This was a fun one. We're actually over time we had so much fun. So thank you so much. And thank all of you for tuning in to day one of three here at Google Cloud Next in beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. My name's Savannah Peterson. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for enterprise tech news.